The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study in connection with Star Wars. I am one of your hosts, James Floyd. I am a freelance writer for StarWars.com and the Star Wars Insider Magazine. And I'm your other co-host. My name is Melissa Miller, and I am a science writer and also freelance writer for Star Wars Insider Magazine. This episode, Star Wars Ologies, is going to chat about the rights of indigenous people seen in Star Wars, as seen uh, especially by like the Ewoks and the Tuscans. Our guest expert today is Jared Tenbrink. Jared's a cultural educator and a doctoral candidate, getting his PhD in science education. He uses distance learning and virtual reality to facilitate tribal cultural education. And Jared is also a member of the Natawa Sepi Huron Band of Potawatomi that are located in the Great Lakes region. Welcome, Jared. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. We're glad to have you here. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research and a little bit about your background? Um, I'm curious about how integrating technology into cultural education became your focus. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm an enrolled member of the Nawa Sepi here on Band of Potawatomi. My background is in education. I was a science educator, and then I worked as an what's called an instructional coach. So I worked, went into classrooms and worked with teachers to help them improve their practice. I decided I want to get my PhD. So I looked at a number of programs, and the University of Michigan has an outstanding program in science education. But over time, my research interests kind of changed, and I moved away from science education into what's called the learning sciences, which is like how people learn more generally. So that kind of led me into this space of indigenous uh, educational issues. And I was really interested in how indigenous ways of knowing and traditional or traditional ecological knowledge or traditional knowledge or whatever you want to call it can be a center point in science education and really pushing it back against like colonization and some of the like mainstream like practices in science and how we can kind of change science to be more inclusive. And along the way, one of the things I started to really learn about and I started to deal with myself was it was really hard for me to stay connected to my own tribe and culture because I live pretty far away from our center. So how do we like facilitate that? Like how do you bring people together and help them learn? learn about tribal culture when it's traditionally taught in these like circles and with people directly. And so VR kind of came out as that. So for my dissertation, I, I took a 360 camera and I went out to reservations and met with tribal elders in a couple of different tribes. And we made these educational videos. And then the idea is you put the VR headset on and it's like you're right there in that space because not everybody can go to like rural Western Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is about 10 hours from here and learn like kids in Detroit can't do that. So that's kind of really cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Tell us a little bit about your Star Wars background and whether or not it influenced your field of study at all. Yeah. So my earliest memory of Star Wars is getting the Ewok village in the mid 80s as a Christmas present. And I had the original Ewok village. And of course, I'm pretty sure it broke and I fell down the stairs a couple of times. But yeah, like I, I remember as a kid, absolutely loving Star Wars, uh, all the movies, watching it quite a bit, watching it on TV. I didn't really dive into all that Star Wars is probably more like eight years ago. I used to travel a lot for work and I started listening to some of the Star Wars audiobooks, and I kind of got into the books. There's so many, right? Yeah. You know, especially if you get into the Legends area, it's insane. So I've been like, I'm not even going to go there. I'm only <laughs> focusing on what's more recent and what's what's kind of connected and, and still considered canon. Uh, and then, you know, I had kids. And of course, I had to take my kids to see the movies. My, my oldest, his first movie was uh, The Force Awakens. Cool. And he was little and I took him in there and I can still remember the look on his face. He his jaw just dropped. He just sat there the whole movie just enthralled. And so and that's continued today. Yeah, he's he's still a big Star Wars fan. I'm a Star Wars fan. We watch the TV shows. So how would you define an indigenous population both on Earth and in Star Wars? I think when we think about indigenous people, we talk about traditional, like people who were, often we talk about people who are impacted by colonization. So there are people around the world, 
right, who have been impacted by this experience that happened over the last 600 years in the, on this planet. So um, it's a little trickier, I think, maybe when you're thinking about other planets and in a, a fictional space, but I still think it is, it's still kind of that same idea, right? Like somebody comes in and tries to take over. And that's what we had with colonization. You had people from certain countries in certain parts of mostly really Europe who then went out and their goal was to conquer the world and to take over as much as they can. And I think if we're talking Star Wars, you can say that with the Empire, but it's not only the Empire, right? I mean, you could even say there were the Republic was probably doing that at points too, but um, so the indigenous people are the people who were in that space and living who then basically have some sort of outside invading force come in and take over. That's kind of an off the cuff definition. Yeah. So it almost is defined by having an other entity that uh, the colonizers or the invaders. And then so this is the pre-existing population. And so that they're kind of connected to each other through that lens. Yeah, I mean, I hate defining it that way, too. I know. I hate defining it by the experience, but it's it's hard for me to kind of like when we talk about it, I was talking once with some other people and we were talking about these indigenous experiences and somebody said, well, you know, everybody's unique and all these tribes are unique and all these people around the world are unique. I wasn't the person who said this. Somebody much smarter than me was like, yeah, but all of them have the shared experience of this outside force coming in. Right. When you look at people from Australia, New Zealand, Africa, South America, North America, Central America, and the list goes on, even within Europe, there are what would be considered indigenous peoples who mm-hmm. have been subject to colonization, outside forces coming in and taking over and trying to push people off of their land. No, and that's interesting that you said, too, because immediately you think about the connection with the Empire, and that's like just literally what they're doing, right? Everywhere we see them. Uh, I don't know if you watched the show Andor. There's all that obvious sort of stuff, but I like what you said, too, about the rebellions probably did it at certain points, too, or, you know, just um, casual groups, not as organized as the rebellion or the empire. So that's really interesting to think about. Or just random people showing up on a planet that they don't have to be part of it. They don't think of themselves as a colonizing force. They just happen to be the ones there and they're like, oh, hey, we want to do stuff on this planet. Oh, hey, there's people who live here already. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking of like the Ursos or whatever. We don't see anyone else on that their planet at the beginning of Rogue One, but you know, they're also probably, it's not the planet necessarily that they're from. So yeah, and I don't know if people would think of them as indigenous people, but in the book Ahsoka, right, was the name of that mm-hmm. planet. In that the, the, the planet, farm planet? Right? Yeah, the farm planet, right? The Empire comes in and as it's essentially just using that land and stripping that planet is the right. premise. And those people were advanced. They were, you know, intelligent, you know, well, they're they're like part of the republic. And then the empire comes in and essentially takes over and drives them off of their land and they fight back. But in the end, they all end up, if I remember right, being evacuated. I think Bail Organa, I think, is, sends mm-hmm. in a force or something like that. Well, we can start off by talking about the Ewoks. You were someone I yeah. talked to when I wrote an article for Star Wars Insider about the Ewoks and sort of the parallels there. That is sort of, I feel like even as a kid seeing it, uh, that was certainly something that I recognized at the time that this was clearly, you know, the native population and, you know, the empire building their shield generator there obviously was going to affect their behavior and that they were sort of ready to fight back. Tell us a little bit about the significance of C-3PO in that storyline. Uh, you know, there's the Ewoks thing, he's a deity, but then also him telling the rebel story around the campfire. Yeah, you know, I talked with a friend about this a while back. The Ewoks are, I think, a better representation compared to some of the others of indigenous populations within the Star Wars universe. And I think a big part of that is that they are these agenic eight people within that space. You know, they're knowledgeable about what the Empire is doing. They're doing their own thing, right? They're not, the Empire is not paying much attention to them and they're not paying much attention to the Empire. And yeah, the the guys come along, the men within the party, or at least the men of the main characters, and they get captured. But C-3PO comes along and he sits up and they see him and they recognize him as as something 
that in their faith structure is out there and his programming is not to person impersonate a deity and you're like well that's ridiculous but when you think about it there's a couple of things that are interesting about that one is right his creator if i'm remembering right is anakin skywalker but that means anakin skywalker darth vader programmed c3po to not be a deity to not act uh-huh. like a god yeah if you think about it I mean, he did have his memory wiped, but that doesn't mean he was necessarily reprogrammed. And that means also that potentially this was an issue in the past where somebody would show up at a planet and they'd be treated like a god and the robots, they didn't want to do that. And so they specifically told robots, you're not allowed to do that. Right. Um, right. So, I, I mean, I think that's interesting. I don't know what it means, but I think it's interesting. The Ewoks see it. And then what happens is, you know, Luke Skywalker takes advantage of that. Oh, you're going to become angry and use your magic. And he's like, what magic? I don't have magic. And again, C-3PO is like, I can't do these things. And it's one of those like, are Jedi's good questions <laughs> too, right? And here's Luke essentially, it's, it's the complexities of the universe. And I think it's actually a good example too of good versus evil and that there's always that gray area and so luke skywalker essentially takes advantage of that to intimidate these people and get themselves out of the trouble that they put themselves into right because of the way they treat them in the beginning and we talked a little bit about this right princess leia encounters wicket right her approach is respect and reciprocity and she offers him food and offers him a gift and he returns that gift by giving her the gift of helping her get out of there the guys come in and they're hostile and aggressive and their response is hostility and aggressiveness you know right most of the ways we communicate are nonverbal. So I think that is really significant to me. I don't know whether George Lucas thought that when he was putting this all together, but to me, it kind of stands out. Yeah, Yeah. with Wicket and Leia, that there's an instant bond and connection, and I think it's because Leia, you know, has been trained as a diplomat and as a politician. Is like, how do I connect with people? Very simple things. Just start with simple things. Like we both eat. Let's all offer some food. Or here, you can check out my hat. And after they both work together to defeat the the biker scouts, like Wicket leans forward to have Leia pick him up off the log. Like he just expects it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, no, there's a lot there. And it's a really good thing for, you know, defeating the Empire, right? If the Ewoks are really that crucial, then, um, you know, if we just left it up to Luke and Han and R2-D2 even, the rebellion would be screwed. Yeah, it makes me think too, like you bring up with being a diplomat, right? Like, I feel like I've read it somewhere that there was like a technology threshold in Star Wars. I know I've read it in other science fiction canon from other series. (laughs) You know, there's this idea of like how you interact with undiscovered communities, communities that they don't know about. But I think, too, like one of the things that's interesting, even further rolling forward in the books, right? It's last shot. Mm -hmm. The one that's the Han Solo and Lando book. Yeah. They have an Ewok with them. Yes. Right. So here's in the future. Right. You know, so we, this is our first encounter with Ewoks, but they don't stay on that planet. They come in and they get involved and they do things and, you know, they're not. And again, it's like, I think that's why the Ewoks continue to be this, like, they're not static. They're not passive. They're Mm -hmm. active. They're agenic and they evolve over time and they change. So at what point, like we have Pikba basically joining the global society is at some point she or the Ewoks as a whole no longer become indigenous, even though they maintain their own culture. Does that make any sense? Um, I would argue that they are still indigenous peoples, right? They're still on their home planet. They still have their native space and that's Mm -hmm. what they're indigenous to, right? And how uh, community and and culture define itself certainly changes over time, but I don't know what it's like for other people. But one of the things like I've always kind of felt for me personally is that real strong connection to place. Mm -hmm. Like I live in Detroit. My ancestors for hundreds of years lived in this area. I don't know for other people, but for me, I still feel that really strong connection to this place. Right. And when I leave 
uh, the Great Lakes. You know, I moved away for time and it was fine, but it's always different when I come back here. So I don't know, you know, I think they're always going to be indigenous to Endor in their way. Mm -hmm. Um, But just like me, right? Like I'm not, I don't live the same way my ancestors did. I don't do all the same practices. Some tribal members carry on with a lot of practices, like a lot of traditional practices. Uh, That's not necessarily me. Like there's some that I do and there's some that I, you know, I don't know. Uh, We talk about things being set down. The idea is that there were lots of things along in the last few years that have kind of caused us that that kind of led to some of these things being set down. And today we're picking those things back up and we're relearning them. But even still, like my father and, you know, my grandmother, they didn't necessarily know what I know. And I don't know what they knew, but I still would Mm -hmm. argue that we're still indigenous because we are still connected to this place. And even if you've assimilated into the society, you're still impacted by that colonization. Colonization and those impacts, they're like in your DNA, you know, even if you do kind of like if you're driven off of that land, you're still going to have that impact and that loss. Right. That makes sense. Well, before we move on to other topics, I'm just curious a little bit more about the Ewoks. Is there other parts of that that you identify with at all? You know, the storytelling, the dancing, those sorts of aspects of just life and and ritual. Yeah. I mean, again, like it's this community and they are primitive in comparison to to the Empire, to the Rebel Alliance, right? They don't have lasers, They have, you know, regular, you know, crossbows and spears and things like that. It sounds funny to reference it, but the Ewok village had an elevator, the little one I had, you know, so they weren't, (laughs) they had all kinds of, you know, they were an an advanced group, not as advanced as the empire. And they didn't necessarily have the same kind of resources. But I think that's the other thing too, is to like recognize. And so I see that and I see that really well paired with indigenous communities, of the Americas and other places in that we had knowledges and technologies and things. And that, you know, they may not jump out to you right away, but like we talk about it a lot now in the sciences, at least we talk about forest management and controlled burns, you know, native people were doing that. And then people showed up and said, Oh, you should stop doing that because you're going to burn the forest down. And then what happened? The brush built up and the forest burnt down. So, you know, they, that's one of the things I think that's really cool. There were so many little things when I go back and I rewatch it, that I really stand out to me as like really positive things that are real subtle. Yeah. I think one of those things that shows how advanced they are is that they have gliders. They, they make hand gliders um, and, you know, they figured out catapults those for our civilizations, our, our Western civilization, you know, I don't think we could have done those purely with Stone Age technology. They don't seem to have metalworking. They can live way, way high up in the trees. They've got elevators. They've got you know, hang gliders and catapults. For the material that they're, they're able to use, they've gotten pretty far. Well, I think that's the thing too, right? They're using the materials that are available to them, right? I mean, it's the redwood forest, right? But they're giant redwoods. They're these giant trees. Of course, they're going to build things out of wood. And that's actually one of the challenges sometimes for like, you know, the people, the anthropologists who go back and study these things is that some societies, it's hard to really know because they wrote things down on hides, on skin, you know, on leather. They use wood. They use things that decompose. Like here in the Great Lakes region, we don't have a lot of records from a thousand years ago because it's wet and, right. you know, <laughs> but you can go to Arizona and you can find a lot more and you right. can find that they use, and they use different tools in Arizona than they did here. Right. Well, I also definitely want to make sure we get to talk about the Tuscans. That's something for those who have seen Book of Boba Fett. There's some new information sort of about how they live, but you know, if you're just even going off of A New Hope, certain colonies of people on Tatooine, referring to them as sand people, you know, raiders, those sorts of things. And just in general, having this um, seeing as an antagonist to, you know, moisture farmers and and other people on Tatooine. Yeah. You know, I think with the Tuscans, I think starting with A New Hope, it's very reflective too of the time, right? We're talking about the mid seventies. And also I'm far from an expert on Star Wars, but I'm on my understanding right is it's in you know it's like samurais and western and space and you kind of mix it all together and you get star wars and so 
in a way, you know, Luke was supposed to be like this Western frontiers person. Mm -hmm. And if you look at spaghetti Westerns, they certainly would have portrayed the indigenous peoples as raiders, as a negative. They were antagonistic. And I think that's what you see with the the Tuscans in A New Hope. I think actually the Tuscans are a big blind spot in the book of Boba Fett. So I I don't want to dog something that's 40 years old and talk about it in present day terms, but something that's been present day terms, I can talk about in present day terms. And I was actually really unhappy with the representation of the Tuscans in the book of Boba Fett. Like we learn more about their culture and their society and the complexities of it. But it's almost like watching, what was that Kevin Costner movie? Oh, Dances (laughs) with Wolves. Dances with Wolves. You know, here comes... And and it's weird to say, too, because the guy who plays Boba Fett is Maori. He's indigenous. Boba Fett's a white, is a savior who come, an outside savior. Let's say that. He's he's someone from the outside dominant culture who comes in and is their, like, hero. He goes on the train and he fights his way to the front and he stops the train and he does this and he does that. And then when he leaves, that's when the uh, gang comes in and causes the problems. And if only Boba Fett had been there, he would have been there to protect them and to save them. And, you know, there were certainly people from Western Europe who helped and were a benefit. But it takes away that agency and that truth of that a lot of what happened was those indigenous people were pushing back and protecting and doing their thing and fighting in ways that made sense and ways that worked for them. Mm -hmm. And it kind of bothered me. Like I watched that and I was like, ugh, you know, Boba Fett taking over the crime Lord stuff, all that other stuff. Yes. Cool. And I understood too, right. They're trying to like, say like, why does Boba Fett's character change? You know, it was in a certain point of view, The Empire Strikes Back. Like, I just listened to that one because I, I listened to the audiobooks. I never read yeah. them. First of all, the audiobook is great because it's John Hamm. Yeah. Is it really? For, Boba, for the Boba Fett stories, it's always John Hamm. Oh, but wow. I had no the idea. Boba Fett basically, they, I love how they basically try and fix all the holes in the movies and mm-hmm. in a way. And then so I think they're fun and they're enjoyable. But Boba Fett like kills like an innocent guy. Like, you know, he's not a good person. So you have to like, how does his character change where all of a sudden he's like fighting for right and good? And they had to come up with something. I don't know. It just fell flat for me. No, and I certainly felt that while watching it. I also referred to it as Dancing with Wolves. I'm certain there were earlier aspects of it, but it's like the Avatar movies and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. Like the the white savior mm-hmm. storyline is very tired. And I was pretty surprised actually to see it in the book of Boba Fett. So they touch on, you know, certain things, the land rights, they cover at least sort of those indigenous issues, but not in a way that the indigenous people have agency. And that sounds like sort of the main difference um, between them and like the Ewoks where they listen to the story and then, oh yeah, sure. We'll help you or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about any other indigenous communities that we see in Star Wars, like the Gungans or the Jawas? And you mentioned Chewbacca and the Wookiees, or even the Mon Calamari in the world. I hadn't really thought about the Gungans on Naboo, but certainly like it's sort of presented like, well, they live underwater and the Nabooans who are, who is Padme? What is the Padme? The Naboo. The Naboo. The Naboo. Okay. Live, you know, above water, but clearly there's, you know, past connections and past, you know, broken treaties and promises and stuff like that amongst them that are at least hinted at, I feel like in the prequels. So yeah, I'm curious about the history there. And that might be something that's fleshed out more in the books or something that I just don't know about. Uh, I don't know much about them. That's fine. Well, and the Jawas too on Tatooine, although now we've seen them on a different planet in the Mandalorian too. So I wonder, I wonder about the Jawas. I have many questions about how, uh, where Jawas are indigenous to, and uh, they don't really go into anything like that in Star Wars. No. And even in like, in this certain point of view, the first one that's about a new hope, there's a Jawa character in there. And that character, basically his entire world was the sand, that crawler that they were in. The way he they talk in that book, he dreams of leaving and traveling, but he hasn't. It does sound like too, again, that's also a very tight knit community, but they have found, you know, a way to hold on to who they are. That's about all I know about the Jawa. 
So we talked a little bit about other things. You mentioned Star Trek. Certainly the Prime Directive has a lot in common with C-3PO not being able to impersonate a deity. Dances with Wolves and Avatar sort of being that white savior complex. I'm curious about other depictions of indigenous stories that you can think of that you would recommend. Well, I'll tell you on my list of Netflix or Hulu shows to watch is Reservoir Dogs. I've heard a lot of very positive things. I haven't seen it. Reservation Dogs. Sorry, not Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> you know, it's it's like when people say like, what can I, it's almost like when people also will say to me like, what can I do to help the native community? And I always say the same thing. Shop at our stores, watch our movies, listen to our music, whatever it is, like support our businesses. How do we get better representation of different communities of color in Hollywood? Um, hire them and have to make movies. You know, let them direct, you know, not let, but, you know, hire them and support them. And I think that's what you see, too, is when people are telling their own stories, it's better because I'm in education. I do a lot of work. Actually, I've done a number of uh, things here in Michigan on children's literature Mm -hmm. and and indigenous representations um, within children's literature. And there is a study that was done that actually showed they found that the way indigenous authors describe the world, represent the world, show things in their books and the perspectives they take are significantly different than Western European positions. So how we tell our stories is different. And that's different communities. And that that's also really well documented. I always joke, like, if you're going to sit and talk with an elder, you better have time because you're going to ask a question and they're not going to answer your question. They're going to answer three other questions. And maybe eventually they might, when you ask them a different question, they might go back and answer that first one or they might never do it. But the way that communities tell our stories is different. And so like when we look at in education, we often emphasize direct to the point pieces and the way we write is very Western in the West in science, but that's not how everybody communicates. And I think that's true when we start talking about movies and music and television. And that's why it's really important that we have diverse perspectives across the board. We're more successful. Companies are more profitable when they have diverse workforces. Mm-hmm. Um, experiments and science are more effective. I play D&D and there was a new series that came out and there was a huge blind spot. It was dealing with this race of people. It was from like second edition and they brought it into the, what is it, the current edition's fifth edition. Mm-hmm. They brought it into fifth edition and they didn't recognize that there were like these racial stereotypes that were offensive. Right. And it was a huge blind spot. And it was one of those things like, we just didn't think about it. Well, it's time to think you know. about it. Yeah. Well, that's why you need to hire people who think about those things, mm-hmm. you know, right. or, exactly. or have that experience. Yeah. Like when people say like, where are the good representations? I think start with the author. Like if you want to know like a book, right. Look at who wrote the book. I talk about that with children's literature. That's where this whole thing started is like talking children's literature and it's somebody telling a native story. Are they actually a member of that tribe? I buy my kids books. If they're focused on native people or native topics, they're by native authors. And I think that's a good way to kind of go about it. Right. That makes perfect sense. Well, Jared, why don't you tell us who your favorite Star Wars character is and why? Yeah. Um, my favorite Star Wars character is a guy named Sinjir Rathfelis. Mm-hmm. If I'm it right. Of yeah, course, James the, knows right away who that is. Yeah, from the <laughs> Aftermath books. From the Aftermath books. And I love his character story. It's interesting. He worked for the Empire. He goes and works for the Rebellion as part of this team. He identifies as gay, as somebody who's who identifies as not straight. Uh, I was really excited to see that in literature. I just thought he had a cool arc. I like his boyfriend and that whole story. I thought it was really cool. That's one of my favorites. I absolutely love the Aftermath series. It's one of my favorite series of books. I was probably the only person who was like, no, Tamin, when Tamin Waxley gets killed at the end of, uh, spoiler. So um, Rise of Skywalker there. Yeah. Oh, right? right. Nobody knows who he is. And I'm like, oh, no, he dies. Ah. <laughs> you know, so I love those series and I love, I love that character. 
That's awesome. And has it ever been portrayed on screen at all, that character, just from the book so far? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. That's great. I'll have to add those to my very long list of more Star Wars content I have to consume. On a side note, do you know the author Rebecca Roanhorse? No, I don't. Okay, she wrote one of the Star Wars books, um, Resistance Reborn, which takes place as a lead into Rise of Skywalker. And there's, you know, she presents herself as uh, an indigenous person. There's been some people that claim that she isn't, but I don't know, I'd just say, you know, if if you wanted a Star Wars story that may fit from a native point of view, I'd say check it out. Yeah, I'll take a look at that one. Yeah. And and I do want to say that's something that's really common even within the indigenous community, you may notice too, some people will identify as a tribal member. Some people will identify as a descendant. Typically that means they're not an enrolled tribal member, but they have that ancestry because here in the United States, you know, we have, there's a whole, I could go on and on about the history of blood quantum, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's pretty problematic. And so that, but that's still a legacy that we're dealing with. So it could be something like that too. A, A person may, may have indigenous ancestry and said, Oh, I'm native. But then they're like, well, you're not in a tribe. And mm. it's one of the things like, you know, people in the tri- in the native community get pretty defensive about it because not only like there can be actual benefits, but there are, you know, people who just claim it to so that they can feel that, you know, mm-hmm. I can't imagine, you know, somebody showing up on Endor and claiming to be an Ewok if they weren't an Ewok. But that happens here in the United States. There are people who don't have that ancestry, but they want it. And so they claim it. And and so there's there that's a challenge that we have. I'm glad that that came up because that's definitely an interesting part of it. And I didn't realize the different levels and and that there would be pushback of, you know, how credible and, and all of those sorts of claims are. So but it makes perfect sense. Well, if someone is interested in following a similar path, getting into cultural education, the technology that you work with, those sorts of things, um, what would you t- suggest to someone who wants to study a similar field? Yeah. Um, so I'm in learning sciences. There's lots of really great people out there who are doing interesting work in the learning sciences. Um, I think if you're interested in knowing, I'll say first, if you're interested in knowing about indigenous people and some of the challenges we face and the perspectives, a good book I would reference there, a great starting point is a book called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. It's written by an Ojibwe author. He tells a brief history of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And the book really starts in 1876 after Wounded Knee, because you often hear of the heartbreak at Wounded Knee. And he's kind of pushing back against that narrative that Wounded Knee is often seen as the end of the Old West and the end of the Native in America. And he's saying, no. We have this history after that. And Indigenous People's History of the United States is another great place, too, to learn more about that. Uh, If you want to know more about tribal culture and tribal cultural history, I would recommend contacting a local tribe. They have cultural departments. We have cultural events. Those are often open to the public. People want to we want to share our culture and we want people to um, appreciate our culture in respectful ways. So um, that's definitely a great place to start. If you're interested in knowing more about Native science education and those perspectives, uh, I recommend a woman whose name is Megan Bang. She's uh, at the University of Northwestern now, I think, and um, has done some amazing work. Mandaloria is a philosopher, a Native philosopher who um, he's walked on. Um, But he wrote a number of great books, including Custer Died for Your Sins is a great one. The first chapter of that was actually based, originally written for an issue of Playboy. And it's a really good, if you're going to read just one thing, that's a great chapter to read. The whole book is good, um, but that's a really good spot to start too. And uh, Eve Tuck is another author who's, she's Alaska Native and at the University of Toronto and has a lot of really great perspective on that. If you're interested in VR, well, that's an emerging field. And I in education, that's that's kind of new. But um, so I don't have anybody great to recommend for that. Well, where can people find you? Are you on social media? Do you have any uh, publications coming out or existing? I'm on social media, but I'm not active. 
honestly, I don't have any real online presence and I kind of like it that way. And I'm working on my dissertation. And so someday my dissertation will be coming out in about a year and a half. And so look for publications for me then. But right now I don't have anything in the press. Totally fair. And we'll definitely put links to all of those books and recommendations that you gave in the show notes for people. Well, Jared, I want to thank you so much for being here and for sharing your expertise and your thoughts and all of that about uh, this topic. I really feel like I learned a lot and uh, I'm excited to go back and watch Star Wars properties again with a little bit more knowledge. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much for for coming on today. That wraps up this episode of Star Wars Ologies. We want to thank our guest, Jared Tenbrink, and we want to thank all of you for listening. And get your friends to listen, too. Are you looking for the links we might have talked about? Check out our show notes page. It's available at skywalkingthroughneverland.com slash star dash Warsologies. Also, check out the Star Wars Ologies YouTube channel, where we post the episode with related visuals from Star Wars. And if you have an idea for a topic for Star Wars Ologies, or you know an expert we should interview, let us know at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram or at Star Wars Ologies, O-L-O-G-I-E-S, at gmail.com. And we have a fan group on Facebook. We cleverly named it Star Wars Ologies Podcast Fan Group. So join us today, and you can chat with us and fellow listeners about these topics and other ones you'd like to see. Please also rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite service, and share it with your friends. No topic is off-limits, even figuring out what the real odds are for surviving in an asteroid field. We are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can find a variety of other great shows about Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel, including Talking Apes, the Max FX podcast, Neverland Clubhouse, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. There's also a YouTube show called Today in Star Wars History. You can find all of these at skywalkingnetwork.com. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies, when we discuss the importance of herpetology, the study of reptiles and amphibians in Star Wars.